Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream. Today, 10 years after the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, how has the country changed? We'll get the view of Afghanistan's future generation on today's show. Our digital producer, Ahmed Shahab El Din, is here looking out for your live feedback, as always. Joining him on the couch today is Steve Clemens, editor-at-large for The Atlantic. Steve, I know you were in Afghanistan about six weeks ago. Um, ten years after the U.S.'s invasion, how do things look? Just like we always hear, very mixed. You see some signs of progress. I rode around one day with the mayor of Kabul, Kabul you know, whom they sometimes call Mr. Karzai, but not Mr. Karzai, the real mayor of Kabul. <laughs> okay. And, you know, he was out meeting kids. Uh, building schools, showing me the 83 road projects that are going on in the city and planting trees. And, and we didn't have much security. We were out with the people and no problem. Next morning, uh, British Council offices are blown up. I'm out tweeting it at 5.30 in the morning. I end up getting shot at by, by somebody. And, you know, so you get a We mixed actually have picture. an image on my screen, if you'll take a look, of uh, the, you holding the bullet that whizzed past yeah, your head. Yeah, and, and, and so when you're in that kind of situation, it's very hard, when, unless you're there all the time, to say, well, it was the bombing and, and the violence we saw an anomaly? Well, what we now know is that that bombing that morning on, on Afghan Independence Day, the, the day that marked their independence uh, from Great Britain, yeah. um, that this was the pinpoint of a start of a rising new violence and attacks by Taliban inside Kabul, uh, the, which, you know, most recently we had attacks against the U.S. Embassy, yeah. which allegedly Pakistan's ISI directed right through yeah. their embassy. So, uh, so it's pretty remarkable. We, we, we may be at war in Pakistan, with well, Pakistan. That, that's one of the things I definitely want to get into today, and we're probably going to wind up tackling in our post show, is the nature of the U.S.'s relationship with both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Yeah. But it's great to have you here today because we we're going to speak with some young Afghans great. who I think are going to say some similar things to what you've said as well as give some additional context. So thanks for being sure. with us. Uh, of course, this show is all about you, our community. So, if you've got a story that you want to share, you can go to our Facebook page, like it, and you can pitch or post your story right there on Facebook. It could wind up on this show. So when news of Steve Jobs' death broke, the online conversation exploded. And here at the stream, we've been tracking those conversations. Now you can get an idea of just how global this conversation was on TrendsMath. It's an online tool that shows you where in the world and how much a topic is being discussed on Twitter. And since the stream's launch, I haven't seen a single topic get this much, much traction in such a short period of time. Now, many of you focused on Jobs' talent for innovation and how he revolutionized technology. Let's look at this tweet from Digifile. He says, oh, Bill Gates, who's the Microsoft founder, put a computer on every desk, but Steve Jobs put one in every pocket, purse, dorm room, and bedroom. And while Jobs has millions of fans around the world, many probably didn't know this about him. Look at this tweet from James Wetzel. He says, Steve Jobs, a great Arab American, who knew his biological dad was a Syrian Muslim immigrant. Now, hundreds of thousands of these tweets, photos and videos have been circulating online, causing Twitter at times to reach capacity. And many of those tweets included photos and videos of the makeshift memorials that have been popping up at Apple stores. This one is from San Francisco. This is the outside. And you can see uh, this photo was also tweeted. There's uh, some Arabic writing there, some Spanish writing. So definitely people from all over the world um, sending their condolences. This is in Shibuya, Japan. This was also tweeted. Um, just a little memorandum there. And then this is in Beijing, China. Um, so many more of these. But I'll leave you with this photo right here, which is a series of Apple images and logos that together created a portrait of the Apple innovator. Now I'm just going to zoom in a bit and move to the left to give you a sense. As you can see, there's the iTunes logo, the Apple computer, some of the monitors, and some, you know, an iPod there in the bottom left as well, the pink iPod. Um, but, and even in a place, for example, like, uh, you know, a war-torn or a conflict zone like Afghanistan, Apple has its fans there too. Thursday marks the end of the Afghan Youth Voices Festival, which offers a place for Afghans to express themselves through filmmaking, social media projects, and multimedia storytelling. And perhaps they used an Apple product to create this video.
Now, that video comes to us from Afghan Youth Voices, and they requested that we do a show looking at the next generation of Afghans who've come of age in the midst of invasion, conflict, and occupation. It was 10 years ago that the U.S. began military action in Afghanistan in search of Al-Qaeda and its Taliban allies. For many Afghans, the post-Taliban era brought hope for a different future, one that included reconstruction and development of the country's infrastructure after decades of civil war. New technologies actually enabled young Afghans to connect with the world and one another. Greater freedom of movement has meant that Afghan refugees have returned home, some experiencing their country for the very first time. Despite this, the reality on the ground has not lived up to the dream of a reconstructed Afghanistan. After two controversial elections, Afghans complain that corruption is worse than ever and they have serious concerns about national divisions and the possibility of another civil war. So, how does the next generation of Afghans see their future? Joining us now from Kabul is Bakdash Siawash. He's Afghanistan's youngest member of parliament. He's also a blogger and a former TV host. Also with us is Orzala Ashraf. She's a civil society activist who founded the Youth and Women's Leadership Center in Afghanistan. And finally, Mustafa Kazemi. He's a journalist, a blogger, and a photographer. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome to the stream. Thank, Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you and good afternoon. Let's begin with you, Bakhtash. You are a young member, the youngest member of the Afghan parliament. What would you say about the level of corruption currently in African in Afghan politics, pardon? Me? Unfortunately, one of the bad things which happened after 9-11 in Afghanistan was that uh, beside the uh, national and institution building in Afghanistan, we faced with a challenge which names the corruption. It is the first time that Afghan politicians are involving directly on, on the corruption. And mostly these corrupt things has two points. First, from the Afghan side, which is leading by the, by the uh, ministers, by the members of the parliament, and leaders of the political parties. And the second part is the international community involvement in these uh, corruption, the corruption issues. For example, after 9-11, a huge attention of the international community brought to Afghanistan for rebuilding of and reconstruction of the, this country. And uh, we got received more than billions of dollars in Afghanistan, which paid by donors from international community to the Afghan government. When the international community doesn't want an accountable government from Afghanistan, for example, when they spent money in Afghanistan, they didn't ask from the Afghan government that where you are spending this money, we are funding to you. Why and is that? Mostly, Why do you think that is? It, I told you, it has two points. One is the benefit of the international community donors. For example, billions of dollars which came to Afghanistan by the name of the reconstruction and construction of this country that we do not see as much construction and as much reconstruction on the ground as much they paid the money it has two points they paid this money to the corrupt officials of the afghans then they got this money back from them in their own pocket most of the money which came by the name of the Afghan people and rebuilding of this country goes back to account of those corrupt officials which are living on the United States, on European countries, mostly on Dubai. And they make Afghanistan as a, as a company which has shareholders. There is not government. There is a shareholder company which benefiting from the Afghan side, a few members of the parliament, a few members of the cabinet, and also the president brothers and something like that. And other side is the international community craft officials. Okay, I want to get Steve. Yeah, to I, he said something show. very important. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm I'm one uh, of the people out there who doesn't believe that Afghanistan can really grow without some element of, of, of corruption. I'm not necessarily an anti-corruption guy. I am a guy who's against corruption that, and 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 money that ends up in Dubai. Mm. If that money were to stay inside Afghanistan, if you had warlords, if you had 
uh, corrupt players. It's, it, it's not great, but nonetheless, if it stayed within the country, mm -hmm. it would eventually percolate by way of jobs and investment. What you see, and we've seen it with Karzai's family and those closely affiliated, we saw $9 billion leave in a single month outside of the country. The United States, just the U.S. in defense dollars, is spending $120 billion a year, and the country has a $14 billion GDP. The joke in Afghanistan and Kabul is that, that Afghanistan has, uh, Iraq has oil and, and Afghanistan has America. But, <laughs> but, but this corruption yeah. is one that is a a horrible kind of corruption because yeah. you do have the feeling through these international organizations that they're spending vast amounts of money, but then it seeps right out. It doesn't stay in the country at all. It goes outside the country, uh, just as our friend said. Well, this is something that we've been hearing a lot of, that the actual benefits are not playing out on the ground. And Orzala, I'd like to get your thoughts in this regard. You've been doing work with women in Afghanistan since prior to the U.S. intervention or invasion, as some would call it. What have you seen? Are things better, could you say, for women today? Well, uh, this is such a common question nowadays, and I just would like to start from how things were before the 9-11 the or before the actual intervention of the America and its allies. And in fact, I mean, if uh, the way that we see it or the the way many people in Afghanistan see it, that we are comparing the situation of uh, after 2000, uh, October 2001 with whatever was happening before that, meaning be during the Taliban time, meaning during the civil war time, and me meaning during the Soviet occupation. And all those years, like 25 years uh, or 22 years in that period, Afghanistan has experienced war, violence, destruction, and uh, kind of systematic violations of human rights and all that. If we compare that situation with post-2001, of course, there has been very significant achievements or very significant progresses uh, in the in infrastructure field, in the different social and socio-economic, socio uh, social development field, we have had a lot of achievements. But these achievements does not necessarily mean that we have reached to some kind of ideal places. I think in comparison to the resources that arrived to Afghanistan, uh, not only by the United States, but mainly by the United States and the rest of um, uh, other countries, unfortunately, we have, uh, uh, we have made uh, lots of mistakes and there has been uh, much more challenges. Uh, I mean, corruption is one example. I mean, the, the, the other uh, uh, guests here were talking about it, but I mean, there, there are clear responsibilities on two sides when we discuss about corruption. And one mainly is re relied with, uh, with Afghans and with the government. And the, 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 the more important one is with, with donors, with the international community. But because Orzala, we've, if heard they some, are the... we've heard some Afghans saying that the corruption situation has been exacerbated by the intervention of international donors, that it was not such the case under the Taliban. I'm wondering from your perspective as someone who works with women, uh, can you, how do you compare the status of women today vis-a-vis -vis 10 years ago? Well, the way I compare, I mean, in terms of women, we have made tremendous progress. Let's be honest and let's be accountable to ourselves and to, to what we see. Uh, I mean, the, the reason that, I mean, I cannot, it would be hard to say that, uh, to compare in terms of corruption, but in terms of women's rights, it's clear mm -hmm. progress and we cannot ignore it because I mean, by saying there is progress and by saying that under the Taliban or under the civil war period, the women in Afghanistan were suffering, this does not necessarily mean, as it has been portrayed all around the world, that the women of Afghanistan were basically passive. They were just imprisoned in their houses and they were just waiting and just looking forward to see what the world is doing for them. I would counter that with my own experience and with the experiences of uh, hundreds of other women that I know and I have been in contact with uh, who were engaged in some kind of activities, whether it was a home-based kind of uh, economic activity or whether it was a home-based kind of health and education acti activities. Uh, Arzala, I, want to get Mustafa, I want to get Mustafa in really quickly because I also want to open it up to our online community as well. But Mustafa, you were 14 years old, I understand, when the U.S. Uh, first came into Afghanistan. It's been 10 years. You were in the midst of your education. Now I understand that you had to fulfill some of that education outside of the country. So from your perspective, what are the kind of educational opportunities for young Afghans today? Uh, you mean inside Afghanistan? Inside Afghanistan, yes. 
Well, the basic education, uh, which is provided by the uh, Ministry of Education, which is a state-run uh, ministry, is the high school, primary school, secondary school, and we have Kabul University with several branches. The basic thing is that uh, we do have education centers in Afghanistan, but it is about the quality, what a person can become after being a graduate from one of Kabul universities, for example, in comparison to a person who has a one-year diploma, for example, from one of the neighboring countries. Uh, Afghanistan has a lot of a lot of millions of people right now studying, but if we do compare them with with the people who have uh, with uh, with the people who have uh, very few uh, uh, years or probably months of education outside Afghanistan, it is uh, unacceptable that we have been fighting for 10 years apart and 35 years apart to build this country. And the basic thing, the most basic thing, which is education, is not provided properly and, and people are not satisfied and pleased with the education service currently. Uh, yeah, is Bak Baktash, are you there? Uh, Baktash is not with us right now. Okay, well let's go to you then, uh, Mustafa. We have a tweet coming on Twitter from the City Girl 86 She says, there's no doubt that Karzai's government is corrupt and it's painfully obvious that the Taliban will take control after international forces leave. And then on a specific question that came in, uh, from uh, Gerard Van Murek, he says, what do you think of police trainees in Afghanistan? So do you agree that the Taliban might take over? And what do you make of the police trainees? Where does their loyalty lie? Uh, the basic thing, for example, uh, with, the, with the police training is that uh, there are several uh, uh, agencies, for example, NGOs as well as government organizations uh, funded by the donors who are training the police and other forces. Uh, I will return on the fact that uh, if there is no motivation in, uh, in the lines of the police and any other security force, we cannot do anything. We cannot defend a single building if there is no motivation within the forces who are responsible to do that. We do have a lot of uh, a high number of police officers and, and uh, who work within the security system, but there is no motivation between them. They escape the, the, the job. They abandon their du duties, they, they take away the weapons, they, they go home without okay. feeling any commitment or any motivation for their country. And in terms of return of Taliban, uh, it, is, uh, it is a perception that we have after 2014 when the international troops withdraw from Afghanistan, there will be uh, a very bad situation ruling in Afghanistan because uh, there are several perceptions saying that Afghan government is weak and the forces are not capable of taking over the security even up to 2014. But uh, for now, the situation is saying that Afghan forces are developing, they are going, uh, they are going well in terms of equipment and, and training. But we have to wait and see uh, how the times change for the Afghan forces, how they will be able to defend the country after 2014. Because right now, when, for example, some security incident happens in one of the districts or any of the provinces, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, in most of the cases, uh, as I remember, the Afghan forces have asked for the coalition help because they right. were not able to thwart the incident. Now, I, I actually am going to, uh, I want to ask a question to Steve and give our tech team a channel, chance to get um, our Skype back together, particularly because we lost Bakhtash. But Steve, what do you make of this question? We have somebody on Twitter, uh, at Adila. H saying, hi, as an Afghan, I don't believe the occupation of my land will end in 2014. Do you think that this idea, this proposal by the Obama administration to begin a substantive withdrawal or be to have withdrawal by then is credible? I, I think that the president plans to, to draw down, mm -hmm. uh, but not draw down completely. And, and what's not talked about, because it's not uh, agreed to yet, is I think that both uh, the Karzai government, which, which allegedly is going to be going out of government in 2014, but we'll see if that happens. And the Obama administration are thinking of somewhere about between you know, 30 and 40,000 troops remaining mm -hmm. uh, in less volatile parts. And what that is, it's a very different strategy than trying to beat the Taliban. It's a strategy to preempt anyone else from overthrowing the government. Uh -huh. uh, and, and that means that you're not going to have the forces there to dominate the whole scene. Uh, and you're essentially forfeiting the ground to a lot of others. And what you're, what you're beginning to see, and it's, 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 it's again, uh, you know, one of these things that people don't like to talk about, is that I believe we are re-empowering the warlords around mm -hmm. the country because they'll have the greatest capacity to deal with the Taliban. They'll deal with it brutally, but it somewhat runs exactly at odds 
with all that we've been trying to do to create a competent nationwide reporting government, if you will, to Kabul. So let's get, Orzala, I would love to get your thoughts on this. I mean, first, do you believe that the U.S. will have left the country by 2014? And do you think that that's a good thing, uh, particularly if they stay and they are defending a government that some people feel is fundamentally corrupt? Mm -hmm. Well, um the first let's get the first uh, question first uh, do i believe that the, the the united states and the entire international community will leave afghanistan in 2014 i mean this is a deadline that they have selected and my understanding is that probably there will be a a, a, a significant level of um, uh, drawdown i'm decreasing the number of troops de decreasing the number of military engagement here there is also highly uh, a possibility that i can see uh, which it would be less engagement with the internal or local or even regional level politics of Afghanistan. I think the United States and the rest of the world is completely fed up with this war that neither they can win nor they are able or in courage, uh, courageous enough to, to give it up in that easy way because the goals, apparently the goals that they have uh, um, selected for them uh, 10 years ago, I don't think they have achieved that. Uh, we see increase on the terror attacks, we see lots of, I mean, I'm not seeing that just when Osama bin Laden is killed, then this war is over. So more uh, f further in, on this front, I, I personally don't believe that there will be a complete withdrawal, but I have an understanding, and that's also quite fearful in some level because we, we I mean, if, if, if I can say, I, I see more possibility of a chaos in a kind of civil war situation, much more highly possible than having a return of Taliban, as we say. Mm -hmm. A return of chaos, a return of a kind of situation where it mm -hmm. would be very, very hard for anybody, but particularly women as the most vulnerable group uh, or a part of the society. Yeah, th that's something that is uh, a serious major of concern. You know, and then, I want to, uh, I'm uh, sorry to interrupt you just there because we just got Bakhtash up on the phone and I want to broaden the dialogue a little bit and bring this directly to you, Bakhtash. We understand that a number of parliamentarians were dismissed by the Afghan Electoral Commission uh, in the last month or so and that one of them, a woman by the name of Barakzai, is actually engaged in a hunger strike, protesting or dismissal. Apparently, people who had lost the elections were put back in their places. Can you talk to us a little bit about that situation? Yeah. First of all, I would like to talk about the making institution or an institution building in Afghanistan. What we felt in Afghanistan was that the international community directly involved in Afghanistan with the individuals, not with the institutions. And the problem that we right now have in Afghanistan is that we do not have an institution. Everything was like a show. The international community came by the name of brought in the democracy and human rights and women's rights and freedom of speech for Afghanistan. But nothing has been reality for the ground. If you see now the, the women's rights, it is only a show which ends with the draw of the international community forces. If you see the a and A, Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police. It is only like an injury that every Afghan soldier got from the United States three hundred dollars per month with a, the build of the very of big food every day. Now, if they wanted to build an institution uh, in Afghanistan, when the international community withdraw their forces, who will be ready to pay this amount for our police and army every month? The issue of the, so on that, uh, on that not... note, actually, Bakhtash, we're running out of time, but I want to continue that thought. And I also want to broaden the dialogue to talk a little bit about the role of Pakistan in all of this. I want to thank all of you for being with us. Bakhtash Orzal and Mustafa, please stay with us. Steve, great to have your input. Great, thank you. Absolutely, we're going to continue this online. Ahmed, thank you once again. Uh, join us at stream.aljazeera.com. We will be exploring more of the perspective of these young people 10 years after the U.S. invasion. What is life like in Afghanistan? Tweet us at AJ Stream. We'll see you online.
Hi, welcome to The Post Show. We're going to be continuing our conversation about what's happening with Afghanistan's young generation 10 years after the U.S. invasion. Where do they stand today? I actually want to show a little piece for our audience to have some perspective on the ways in which people are using art and culture to empower themselves on the ground. And before we go back to our guests, I just want to show a brief clip from this particular video. It's like a jungle sometimes, it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. It's like a jungle sometimes, it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. It's like a jungle sometimes, it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. Now this is an actually a really interesting video to me because it shows Afghan youth being trained by a graffiti artist by the name of Chu to do an actual visual project. One of the things that's interesting about it is the music that they chose is actually a song by Grandmaster Flash, an American artist out of New York, called The Message. And it specifically says, don't push me, I'm close to the edge. Mm. And I wanted to take this question to you, Mustafa. How, what is the sentiment of young people on the ground in uh, places like Kabul, where you live? Do you feel hopeful for Afghanistan's future? Do people feel that they are indeed close to the edge, or do they believe that there is a brighter day around the corner? Hopefulness depends on uh, how they think. Uh, it's different individual by individual. But the educated uh, uh, class of uh, African uh, youth, they uh, do believe in a good and bright future. But as well as having some uh, uh, tensions and worries about the future, uh, especially uh, after 2014 when the Afghan uh, forces will take over the security responsibility of the entire country from international peacekeeping forces. Now, what worries the, the people uh, in general, every Afghan is worried about the, uh, uh, what is happening to the uh, basic infrastructure things, for example, uh, what is happening to the school, what is happening to the universities, to the children, and, and how are they going to be treated and how their life will change after that. The youth and the, and the young class of Afghan people, most of them are not hopeful for a good future. They are predicting a civil war probably uh, getting very bloody inside Afghanistan with, with no outside interference, but as well as having some hopes saying that Afghan forces are uh, capable of uh, taking the security and the Afghan government is uh, strong enough to rule the country without the presence of peacekeeping forces after 2014. Right. Uh, Orzala, if you're with us, I'd like to come to you with this tweet. Uh, Ibrahim Dazi on Twitter is saying, I'm wondering pretty simple uh, question. Why would the American military be sent there to Afghanistan? They say so many things, but what's the real reason? So if you could just tell us what you think the real reason is, and then also you three are young Afghans. Uh, you've joined us. You're all from Kabul. What do uh, young Afghans outside of Kabul think? I mean, it's a very big country, and Kabul is just one part of it. Yeah, sure. First, uh, uh, let me clarify that I am not from Kabul. I am from uh, eastern province of Nangarhar, mm. uh, but I am currently in Kabul, and I am one of the, uh, uh, the, the development practitioners who traveled mostly around the country. I have built five schools in different parts of Afghanistan, from mm -hmm. Nuristan to Samangan to uh, north of Nangarhar, that in Nur uh, area. These are places that probably you will not hear much more about in, about in the media. Uh, these are not necessarily important parts of the country, but I, I travel around. And, and what, what do I'm you think is there? Uh, what I'm saying is mostly representing people in different parts. I mean, in terms of uh, whether uh, they, they, they are hopeful or not, whether the, the youth uh, in, in different parts of uh, Afghanistan, I would say it very much depends on, on areas. If they come from insecure areas where they are completely frustrated because of lack of access to very basic services, for example, uh, health, education, uh, for example, jobs, for example, justice, courts, and all these things, then they are frustrated and they, they, have, they don't see a clear future uh, ahead of them. If they are coming from places like major cities or district levels where there has been a level of work and in, uh, infrastructure work or uh, institutional work, then they are quite satisfied. I was uh, a couple of weeks ago in Bamiyan province and I see women quite actively engaged not only in the, the, the center of the 
province, but also in the foreign remote districts, foreign remote, some of the foreign remote villages. So that that these are uh, at least signs of uh, hopefulness. And um, what was your second question? Forgive me. The could... first question was, what do you think about? I mean, for example, we have a tweet from Russell Orman saying the U.S. have tore the country up and apart, but it's their responsibility to rebuild it before they leave. Why do you think the U.S. came into Afghanistan? Oh well, well that's a good question to ask the U.S., uh, not not Afghans, because this was not a choice of Afghans. If it, it was a choice of Afghans, uh, probably we would we could avoid the civil wars. We could avoid the, the the rule of the Taliban for six years. That that's a good question. The way I personally see uh, the military intervention, I first of all make a clear distinction between the actual military intervention, war on terrorists specifically, and the development uh, in social development and humanitarian assistance and I am more in favor of later when I say we have significant and tremendous achievements I mostly would, would like to highlight the development assistance to Afghanistan a country that was completely ruined because of partnership or because of fightings between two uh, or major blocks or superpowers of the world we've been we have been the battleground or as we say in Afghanistan the Buzkashi front uh, uh, between these different rival powers. This has been historically the case with Afghanistan, but we are still witnessing this. We never choose this war. This is not an Afghan uh, a war selected by Afghan or chosen by Afghan, but we are the ones suffering from it. So, Orsala, so I on think that it's point that you raised, to... actually, about the idea of Afghanistan being caught between two powers, Steve, I want to bring up something that you mentioned to us before today's show, and that I think is really salient. As we had stated earlier, you had an opportunity to hear from a General Pervez Musharraf, formerly President of Pakistan, at the Washington Ideas Forum here in D.C. today. Um, some are arguing that Afghanistan is caught in the middle of effectively a proxy war between the U.S. and Pakistan. What's your take? Well, I, I, I think it's very complex. I think Afghanistan is a place that has huge, uh, complicated ethnic and political divisions. And so there's a civil struggle already, even before you get to the neighborhood. And then the neighborhood, uh, Iran, India, and Pakistan are themselves animating things inside Afghanistan, and we're injected right in the middle of that. Um, I think it's very disconcerting that our chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's now uh, just retiring, Mike Mullen, has very overtly said that Pakistan had a direct link and was driving, arming, and instructing the Taliban forces that attacked the U.S. Embassy. Mm -hmm. And it's begun to raise the question of are we essentially at, in an informal war with Pakistan now? Uh, our relations have deteriorated so badly since the killing of Osama bin Laden and also as a result of drone attacks and other issues where uh, I think there are legitimate grievances involved with, with, with civilians who have been killed. But it's become a very complex issue. And, and so, uh, as Rosala has, has just said, that the notion that this isn't their war, their struggle is true. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's just remarkable. And it's one of the reasons why I oppose the U.S. remaining so in, in, in engaged and involved, because I think it's a quicksand situation. Yeah. And we have to find other ways to get an equilibrium in that country with other powers. Well, and I, if that doesn't happen, then, then, then this will continue you, to be pulled apart. Well, I think the other powers thing is so interesting to me because mm -hmm. I look at this and it seems that uh, it's not only potentially an intermediary war, but potentially an endless one. Because, you know, oh, not to presume to know what the Pakistani interests are, but one could speculate and say, well, the U.S. has historically had a relatively stronger relationship with India. Uh, it's in Pakistan's interest not to have Afghanistan having a strong relationship with their historical or Pakistan's historical enemy, India, which is a more dominant economic power. So a weaker Afghanistan may be seen as positive for Pakistan. And if the Pakistan can draw resources from the United States, insert itself in between that relationship with India while maintaining a weaker Afghanistan, why stop? What does it take for the U.S. to ever leave? Well, I think what it's going to take, and what we've seen happen recently in American politics, what's driving the debate on Afghanistan today has nothing to do with Afghanistan, not with the human rights condition, the position of women, whether Karzai will be there or not. What's driving the debate today is how much it costs, right. because there's so much of a budget debate going on inside this country. It's a huge divide. It's deeply ideological. And during the debates on the debt ceiling, uh, Grover Norquist, a you know, major anti-tax uh, activist, uh, would regularly raise on, on uh, 
Pierce Brosnan show, on Colbert, on all of these other shows, mm -hmm. what the price tag of Afghanistan was. And now Americans are educated yeah. that we're spending this vast amount of money in, in, in what appears to many to be a sinkhole. And, and on top of that, mm -hmm. I mean, the only, I, I really admire um, our, our colleague on air, but I, I am much more pessimistic about women's rights issues. I mean, I find it criminal because we're spending $120 billion a year. When I was in Kabul a few weeks ago and visited the Ministry of Women, yeah and met the deputy minister there, I was outraged to learn that international agencies and, and donors had promised a nine, $9 million dollar over three year plan, relatively mm -hmm. modest in the scheme of things, over three years to help the government surface, benchmark, brand, get you know, a broader issue. I agree that things may have improved, but they, they have never gotten that money. They've been existing and surviving on about $100,000. It's nothing. So there's a criminal negligence, even after promises have been made in the portfolio about women, when in fact, lots of people say that we're there in part to create, which I, I wouldn't support, but yeah. they're there because of women. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very complex picture. So I want to then give a final word to Bakhtash. Bakhtash, you are the youngest member of the Afghan parliament. Uh, do you see that there is going to be a real substantive influence for your generation in the future of your country, or are you guys caught between the interests of other powers? First of all, I'd like to answer to that question that why the international community, especially the United States in Afghanistan, it, is, it must be really clear that they are not here to build democracy for us, for us, they are not here to build roads, buildings, something like that. It must be clear that they are here for their own benefit. If today they do not fight in Afghanistan against the international terrorism, tomorrow they must fight with them in their own geography. And it is the only question answer that we have for why the international community is in Afghanistan. The issue of the influence of the new generation for politicians in Afghanistan, we are in a struggle between the moderate and the culture and traditionalism in Afghanistan. One of the problems that we have, the, the, the structure of the power in Afghanistan is very culturally, uh, it is that belongs to the elders of the community and the new generation, when they grow up and they uh, rise their wives, they must they get silenced by the, those people which are warlords, which are the, the community elders, especially President Carter. President Carter, when every speech that he has in the university, directly he has one message for the new generation. He says that do not involve on politics. It is the only uh, message that President Karzai has on his, his speech for the university students. If today's generation do not involve on the politics issues, the future of country, who are the future of the country? These new generation are the future of the country, and we must let them to be, practice the, the, the issue of the politics, and they will be the leaders of the, the future of this community. If the elders of community must be ready for that or not, it is the reality that this grow up generation will take the power uh, in the future of Afghanistan. And on that note, we will leave it there. Bakhtash, Orzala, and Mustafa, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate you. Uh, Steve, thanks for joining thank us. You. We hope that you'll come back again soon. Absolutely. And Ahmed, thank you once again for being a conduit for our community. Remember, these shows are about you. Definitely tweet us the stories you want us to cover. Use the hashtag AJStream. As always, we will see you online.